All right, so chapter three starts off talking about uh, the vocabulary of analytical chemistry. And um, there's a lot of terms that you are probably already familiar with, but there's some that you aren't. Um, there's some that I might have already started to use because of the importance of them or just um, used to that using them. Terms like uh, analyte, all right? So analyte is our, the chemical, the species, whatever it is we're, we're looking for, all right? So um, <clears throat> we're going to try to go through this chapter here and become familiar with um, a lot of these, these terms, okay? All right. Um, um, <clears throat> an analysis <clears throat> is um, the, the process, the experiment, uh, to identify, make measurements, and then determine um, the, the presence or the quantity of our analyte. So, our, some examples, or this example here. Um, <clears throat> in 1974, the government started a, a Safe Drinking Water Act to ensure uh, that the concentration of bacteria, specifically um, fecal coliform bacteria, was not, uh, didn't reach a certain point in drinking water, okay? So <clears throat> an analysis is performed by collecting water samples, um, filtering them and placing them onto uh, an auger, a petri dish here that contains nutrient broth, Incubating the sample for 22 to 20 some hours at uh, this temperature. And at the end of the incubation period, <coughs> an analyst counts the bacteria colonies. And um, that measurement makes a determination as to whether or not the, uh, there are determination of how many bacteria are in um, the, the water sample, right? The current maximum contaminant level for total bacterial, uh, including fecal coliforms, is less than one colony for every 100 milliliters of water. So if you have less than one colony for every 100 milliliters of water, then it's still drinkable. Okay, very good. So important terms, analyte. Um, I think everybody understands what making a measurement is. After you make your measurements, in your analysis process, then you make a determination about whether the, uh, uh, the situ what the situation needs more attention or if the water can be drink, that sort of thing. Drinking. Drink? All right. <clears throat> uh, moving on to number two here. Um, a method. A method or a technique is any chemical or physical principle that uh, we use. So you can think of um, titration as a technique. You can think of um, different forms of spectroscopy. If you, do you know what any forms of spectroscopy are? Uh, we use the spectrometer in 105. Very good. That's an example of a, a technique. All right. Um, we just talked about growing bacteria on a plate. That would be considered a technique. All right, anything that you can do, any kind of kind of experiment, type of experiment, that's your technique. Um, and then the method is the application of that technique. So HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography, is an example of a technique, but every technique has um, a variety of number of, of, of methods, okay? And then within those methods, you're going to have given procedures, the recipe, kind of like, um, written directions on how to follow. Um, protocol, <coughs> we can consider a, a protocol a little bit more stringent, um, something that you, you can't break, right? Um, so when we have protocols that we have to follow, it becomes very important that the laboratory sets up a way to verify that those protocols were followed so that when we determine that there's an issue, we can actually look back and make sure that uh, the appropriate protocol was followed, the procedures were all done correctly. Okay, good. Classifying analytical techniques. Um, 
Techniques can um, <coughs> be separated into <coughs> two different kinds, and we kind of mentioned this previously, but um, one, you can think of it as a, kind of a, a destructive techniques. Um, as you use your material, it, it, it's gone, it's not available to you. Um, a non-destructive technique, you know, kind of like spectroscopy, you can put the material in front of the spectrometer, and um, it, it's not dependent on how much material you have in there, as long as there's enough to, to cover the opening where the light is passing through. Um, it's really going to be dependent on concentration. Uh, here's a couple of bottles, a couple of graduated cylinders filled with some copper nitrate. Same concentration. But if I have a destructive system and I use this sample or this sample, the one on the right is going to consume it all and give me um, a, uh, a signal, A, based on the amount of material, amount of, amount of the moles of material here. So N being the moles of material and K being some constant because, you know, signal is not going to have the same units as moles of material, right? So this side over here would give me less signal because there's less moles, all right? But um, other types of techniques only are, base, are based only on the concentration, the concentration. And so if it's just based on the concentration, then if you are looking at both of these samples, um, they'll give you the same amount of signal, right? So if signal is based on uh, the actual amount of material, then it's more of a classical technique. Um, if uh, the technique responds to the absolute amount of analyte, right, and it's a total analysis technique, okay, um, if uh, a mass, a second class of analytical techniques are those that respond to concentration. And uh, this is um, a less classical technique and what we would more call an instrumental technique because instruments generally take small samples of material. They don't require um, a lot of material. Okay, good. So moving on to section 3.4, um, selecting the correct analy analytical method. Okay, so let's talk more about accuracy here then. Um, accuracy, we talked about a little bit um, when you go golfing. Do you remember that golfing analogy? Uh, yeah, I think so. You said you were a good golfer because on average, everything went in the hole. That's right. However, it doesn't really mean I'm a good golfer because accuracy uh, is not enough, right? On average, you might have the right value, but you need to have precision as well. So keep that in mind as we talk about accuracy. So this is how close the, your measurements are to the real value, right? What we call the true or expected result. Sometimes you know that because you have a standard, but um, there's many times where we, we don't know that. And so really all we have is a, a large collection of data that kind of points or we can extrapolate to a specific value. The error is the difference between the obtained result and the expect, expected result. Okay. And percent error or relative error is the difference between the obtained result and the expected result divided by the expected result times 100. All right. So we have two types of error. This is called absolute error and this is called relative or percent error. All right. And it's important that um, we think about the, the best way to present these. I think that in general, you'll want to be thinking more along the lines of percent error, okay? Um, <coughs> precision, here's another example of precision. Um, if the accepted value, or even if you don't know what the accepted value is, um, you can see this distribution of results suggests that whatever method was used here in, in sample A as opposed to sample B, sample B might be giving me the same result, but when we cluster, then we it suggests that the, 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 um, the method 
or the um, technique is better than sample beads. Okay, and this depends on a lot of different factors, right? Uh, sensitivity. Sensitivity is the ability to demonstrate um, that two different analytes have essentially the same amount of uh, material in them using the same method over and over. Okay? Um, now don't confuse this with detection limit. Detection limit is just saying how low you can go and get um, a signal, a reasonable signal. Um, sensitivity is a measure of its ability to establish that there's a difference between two samples. Okay, so um, here is a, an equation that kind of helps us think about sensitivity. Now, do you remember these equations? 3.31 and 3.32. I'm going to click on this so we can look at it really quick. Uh, that's going to work, right? There we go. 3.31. Oh, it's up here. The signal of A is related to the moles of A times some um, proportionality constant, right? Now, make sure we understand what's going on here. <coughs> N is moles. Our units, right? S signal is going to be some sort of uh, an electrical signal or um, um, you know absorbance. Absorbance we say is unitless. I will talk more about what absorbance means in, in, when we get to that chapter and talk about it. Um, I should kind of give you a brief understanding of why it's considered unitless right now and what that means. All right, so. Uh, maybe we talk a little bit now to, to get an idea. So if I have my cuvette that has my sample in it, right, and it's in a spectrophotometer, and let's draw the kind of components of a spectrophotometer. We'll do this multiple times throughout the, the, the course because it's, it's essential that we have an understanding of how uh, spectroscopy works in, in general. This isn't the specifics for everyone, but... In general, this is these are the different components, right? You have a light source, right? Light source. Um, often there's something called a, a collimator or something that will um, um, get all of the light to kind of be heading a certain direction, right? Because you want the light to come through the light source at one point. You also will have in here sometimes a diffractometer, it's called, or um, essentially a prism. And now the prism will change the uh, direction of your, your light, and then you might have another collimator here that will choose just the wavelength you're interested in. Um, and then this goes through your sample and so the intensity of the light going in is compared at the detector to the intensity of the light coming out, okay? So if we call this, um, you know, whatever amount of light goes through, and, and that's what we do when we put our, our blank into a spectrophotometer and, and blank it or calibrate it, it's telling the instrument what 100% of the light should look like. And then the fraction that comes through is, is compared to this 100%. <clears throat> and we can get an absorption with this uh, equation here. First of all, we can look at what we call transmittance. Transmittance is this ratio of light out over 100% of the, I mean, all the light that was in there. Okay. And then percent transmittance is that times 100. Okay. And then absorbance is the log of um, transmit or the negative log of transmittance, the log of the inverse of transmittance, right? 100% over the, um, the fraction of light that came through. Okay. So 
notice that the intensity, whatever the units are here on intensity, is divided by the units here. And so there's, there's no units. And then you just take the log of that ratio there, and that gives you the absorbance. Okay? Now, an important question that I always ask students, and that I'll ask you uh, again, is because some of you have some familiarity with, or remember, interacting with and using a spectrophotometer. Um, and again, we've seen this before, but the plot is absorbance versus wavelength. Do you remember this plot? We talked about this a couple chapters ago a little bit. Yeah. Um, what is wavelength again? Uh, the wavelength of the different electromagnetic energy waves, the photons. That's right. Different electromagnetic energy, different wavelengths. And absorbance now, you see, is this uh, relationship here, the log of how much light goes in over how much light comes out. So let's say that at a given wavelength, now, do you remember any values? I mean, what kind of numbers were along here? Do you remember? Um, I'm not sure. Was this like 100 or 25? Or do you remember what a, a high amount of absorbance was? Uh, oh, wait, I do remember. Um, the lab said that we shouldn't get an absorbance above like 1.3 or something. Okay, very good. So an absorbance of 1, let's say, is you know a, a pretty high absorbance. And what I'd like to ask you now is if I have an absorbance of 1, how much light does that say has been absorbed by that sample? What percentage of the light has been absorbed by the sample? If absorbance is one? That's right. So how would I know that? Well, we have our equation here. Absorbance equals the log of this ratio, light in over light out, right? Intensity in over intensity out. <coughs> and if I've said that absorbance is one, and um, we can think of this as a, a fraction. Can you see that? So for example, if, if the amount of light that went in what we call 100%, uh, then the amount of light that comes out, um, you know, if it was, uh, let's say half of the light came out, so 50, right? So for this scenario here, you take the log of, of um, two, is that right? Okay, I think I see that. So 100 divided by 50. All right, so let's get our calculator involved here. Um, on, I'm going to take the log of 2. So it's 0 0.301. Okay, 0 0.301. Um, so what would the value be if I had an absorbance of 1? So that, that 0 0.301 is... 0 0.301 is what you'd get if you took the log of 100 over 50, right? Yeah, I see that. Okay. So now on the other one, we just need to put in for 50 some x value. Okay, good. So over x, right? And now we're trying to find out when I get an absorbance of 1, how much light has been absorbed. Yeah. So uh, let's see. We... Um... I forgot how to solve logs. Okay. Um, let me remind you of this from, I don't know if it was Math 111 or 110 or when it was, but, and you can always look this up on the internet if you can't remember, but log of x over y, for example, is equal to the log of x minus log of y. Do you remember that? Oh. Uh, I do now. Okay, good. Let's do one more here. Not because we're going to be using it, but because it helps us. Log x times y. Is that log x plus log y? That's right. Do you remember a little bit? Yeah, I think I actually do. Okay, good. So, log x over y allows us to separate these variables out, right? So, if I have 1 equals log 100 over, log, uh, 100 over x, I can do... 1 equals log 100 minus log of x. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, okay, so then what? What do you think? Uh, well, what's the log of 100? The log of 100, any ideas? I think I know it's 2, right? Yeah, because um, the log is basically asking um, you know, how many decimal points from the 1 do you move? 10 to the what equals 10 to the what? That's the value you're solving for, right? And it's 2 equals 1. So this times 10 to the what equals 100, and that's 2. So 2, so 1 equals 2 minus log of x. All right. So now I'm going to subtract my 2 on both sides. So I have negative 1 equals the negative log of x. See that okay? Yeah. Subtracted 2 here and got rid of it here and made that a negative 1. And now uh, I'm here at this, 1 equals log of x. I mean, I just divided both sides by negative 1 there. Now, how do I solve that one? Uh, I can't remember that. Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, take the negative log of x, or sorry, inverse log of x. So, for example, if, let's get this out of the way now, bring it right here in the middle. If I have... Uh, my calculator here, I do this one here, and then I do the second log, and that reminds us, oh yeah, it's just rising, raising 10 to the, 10 to the 1, and then I get a value of 10. Okay, so what I did was, again, to go um, 1 equals log of x, I go the inverse log, and then I put in my 1 value there, okay? So that means 10 is the value of x. So that means 10 equals x. So what has that told us? Tell us, what, is that, what, what have we found? What percentage of the light has been absorbed? 10%? No, x equals 10. Oh, um, uh, I don't know. Well, so if x equals 10, right, we can look at it back in here. And what was 100 here? Uh, I can't remember. 100 was the, all the light that went in, right? 100 was the initial intensity of the light. Okay, yeah. And 10 is the light that came out? That's right. So if 100 went in to our sample, so 100 went in, and how much came out? Just 10. That's right. So what percentage of the light was absorbed? 90%. That's right. 90% of the light was absorbed. Now... Again, this is a little bit of review because we already talked about this, but I want to recall, I want you to recall that if I plot absorbance at a specific wavelength, so we'll call it lambda max <coughs> versus concentration, right? This is when I'm making my standard curve. Does this make sense? Yeah, I understand this. I remember this, yeah. So if I have various concentrations, how is this, I mean, this is going to be a linear relationship, right? Beer's law is absorbance equals concentration. I'll throw in path length and extinction coefficient, and those are useful later on. But right now, essentially, all we're looking at is absorbance being equal, uh, linearly related to con concentration. Okay. Um, but as this value here, the value of x, the light that is actually coming through, uh, gets really low, then you've absorbed it all. No more light can come through. All right? So here at 1, an absorbance of 1, for example, we've already removed 90% of the light. There's only 10% of our signal left. And if I keep raising the uh, concentration, there will come a point where all the light is absorbed. So it doesn't matter if you raise the concentration anymore, you can't get any light through anyway. Right? Yeah, okay. So you have to be careful. And in analytical um, spectroscopic methods or um, <clears throat> uh, certain protocols or um, procedures, right? You don't want a procedure that would allow um, somebody to report an absorption value above, well, some labs even say 0 0.8, 0 0.8, right? 
spectrophotometers are becoming um, less error prone. So if the sample is stable and put in there correctly, you will get the right value. But still, even just shifting that sample in the spectrophotometer, you'll see this value shift and kind of wobble in this region. And so in, in labs, generally, people don't want absorbances above 0.8 because you don't want to be approaching that region where you um, are, are no longer in your detectable range. Okay, so um, this is an example. I mean, we, we had a long conversation here to essentially show that some um, um, units or some, some, some values are unitless. Okay, an absorbance, which is one that we frequently talk about and use a lot, are, is, is, is unitless, right? So, um, oops, we've got to get back to this one here. So, what we were saying is the signal might have no units, might have to be unitless or different units than the moles here or concentration, maybe molarity, parts per million, whatever it is. So you have to have a proportionality constant, okay? And so the signal relates to either the moles or the concentration, as we mentioned, and we have the proportionality constant. Now, let's go back to where we were. Mm -hmm. There we go, okay? So the sensitivity then begins to be the change in sample or change in signal uh, that you get divided by your proportionality constant um, relative to the change in your moles or change in your concentration. So for example, if I have a concentration of 10 parts per million um, and I change that concentration to 11 parts per million, the delta C, the change in concentration, will be one part per million here, right? Now the signal, um, how will it change? Will it be able to change from the difference between 10 and 11 parts per million? Will you be able to see a difference in the signal um, divided by your proportionality constant there? Um, so that's the question that we're trying to find out, and that's an uh, uh, answer to uh, how sensitive your, um, your technique is and not the detection limit, which is basically saying how small of a concentration you can get. Okay. Specificity and selectivity. We have an equation for that as well. Here we have... SA, the signal from our analyte, right? But if there is an interferent, an interferent or something that gives signal uh, in the region or in the location um, that's consistent with our analyte, but is not our analyte, right? So down here, they begin to give us some examples of um, calcium and zinc. If there's interference, for example, because of zinc, uh, when, you, when you're trying to measure calcium for a given technique and method, right, then um, you have to take into account that interference. And the specificity is that is your method or technique specific to the, the calcium, for example, or your analyte. And if it's not, then you have to look at the signal from your analyte and compare that or add that to the signal of your interferent and you get what we call the signal for the sample, all right? And this, again, can be broken down into the proportionality constant and the moles uh, of the analyte plus the proportionality constant in the moles of the interferent. And we see here, when you're talking about concentration, we get the same relationship, okay? So selectivity is the measure of uh, its freedom from interference. Right. Uh, we can also get what we call a selectivity coefficient, or the coefficient for the analyte times for the coefficient for the analyte in the presence of the interferent. All right. So the coefficient of the interferent 
divided by the coefficient of the analyte gives us this new coefficient, which is what we call our selectivity coefficient. So this value here might be um, a positive one or a negative one, depending on the, the signs of K1 or Ka. But the selectively, selectivity coefficient should be less than either positive or negative one. If it's greater than positive one or greater than negative, you know, larger in the opposite direction is the negative one, less than negative one. And that means the method is more selective for the interferent than for the analyte. All right, so you can test your selectivity of your technique by looking at the value of the selectivity coefficient. So this is straightforward if you have Ka and Ki, um, but we can also determine Kai by measuring the signal from the sample in the presence and in the absence of the interferent. So let's look at this example here. A method for the analysis of calcium in water, right, suffers from interference from zinc when the concentration of calcium is 100 times greater than that of zinc. <coughs> An analysis for calcium has a relative error of 0.5%. What is the selectivity coefficient for this method? All right. Since only relative coefficients are reported, we can arbitrarily assign absolute concentrations make the concentrations easy. Uh, let's let the <coughs> calcium concentration be 100. All right, so we don't need to put units on it really right now. And zinc will be 1. All right, <coughs> and that's what the problem dictated. Concentration of calcium is 100 times greater than that of zinc. So calcium's concentration is 100. Zinc's concentration is 1. Relative error is 0.5%. That's again what we got there means the signal from the presence of zinc is 0.5% greater than the signal from the presence of to the absence of zinc. Again, we can, so, you know, this difference, the relative error, 0.05%, was from uh, comparing a sample with the zinc and a sample without the zinc. So again, we can assign values to make calculations easier. If the signal for copper ion all by itself is 100, then the signal in the presence of the zinc is 100.5, all right, because that's the 0.5 percent. Therefore, the value of C, uh, the proportionality constant for the calcium, is um, <clears throat> one, right? We've kind of fixed that to be one for us. And but in the presence of the zinc, the um, signal for the sample will equal 100.5 which is equal to the proportionality constant for calcium times the calcium concentration. All right, so we know <coughs> the calcium concentration, we put that at 100 times 1, the proportionality constant, so that's 100 here. Right here, right? Proportionality constant for the zinc is what we're needing to, to solve for here, times the concentration of the zinc, which is going to be fixed to 1 for us. <coughs> then we can see that... Um, from this equation right, that little portion of the equation right there, we can solve for the um, proportionality constant of the zinc, all right, and put the proportionality constant of the zinc over the proportional proportionality constant of the calcium, and then get a um, our proportionality count constant for the relationship, or you know, what is our sensitivity, our selectivity, sorry, coefficient for uh, calcium in the presence of, of zinc, 0.5. Very good. And then you can kind of think of it as working backwards here. When you take the obtained result, the um, experimental result in the presence of zinc, and we said that that would be uh, 100.5 minus the 100, which is the obtained result in the absence of the zinc, divided by 100, and times 100 again, to get it into a percentage, and that's where we get our plus 0.5 percent. All right, so that's where this plus 0.5 percent came from, right? Um, we just made up these, these obtained results, but that's all right. We just needed to 
make it so that our obtained results compared to our uh, or our results in the presence of zinc and the absence of zinc here um, had this absolute error or this relative error percent relative error okay good so here's an exercise here 3.4.1 um, in this method they analyze the silver ion and when analyzing a solution that contains this concentration in the presence of that concentration of nickel, right? It's a fluorescence technique. It was 4.9% greater than that obtained for just the silver solution alone. And we want to know the selectivity coefficient for this method. Okay? Uh, so, to get the selectivity coefficient, right? The selectivity coefficient of uh, the selectivity of silver AG in the presence of nickel, right? That selectivity coefficient is the um, proportionality constant for nickel over the proportionality constant for our silver, right? The selectivity coefficient, the proportionality constant of the interferent over the proportionality constant of our analyte. Okay, so um, we need to find the proportionality constant for our interferent. We need to find the proportionality constant for our um, analyte. Uh, the proportionality constant for the analyte should be pretty straightforward, right? Um, the uh, signal for the analyte equals the concentration of the analyte times the proportionality constant of the analyte, all right? And the signal, we aren't given necessarily signals for either of these measurements with or without the nickel, so we can just set it to 100 for ourselves. The concentration of sil silver we are given, and the concentration of silver is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 9, and so we can solve for our um, proportionality constant for that of the silver, right? So I'm going to get 100 divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 9. So 1 times 10 to the 11th is the proportionality constant for silver. Man, I don't know why that's so hard for me to do. 1 times 10 to the 11th. And now I just need the proportionality constant for the nickel. Um, but we don't know the concentration. We know the concentration of the nickel, but we don't know the signal due to the nickel, except that we do know that there is an augmentation of the signal of 0.5%. Uh, oh, no, sorry, we're looking at the wrong one here. <laughs> there it is, 0.4.9%. Okay, so... Um, we can use the collective information in terms of the signal from the sample, which is going to be the augmented, augmented um, signal, equaling the proportionality constant times the concentration of our analyte plus the proportionality constant times the concentration of our interferent. And we know, so let's copy that down for us here, the signal from the sample is due to Right? It's the, the sum of these two um, relationships, right? Concentration times its proportionality constant for our analyte, AG, plus the concentration and the proportionality constant, concentration of our interferent, which is nickel, times the proportionality constant for the nickel. All right? So what do we know here? Uh, let's see, you know the concentration of the silver. That's right, we know the concentration of the silver. That is our 1.0 times 10 to the minus 9. The proportionality constant for the silver you found, 1 times 10 to the 11th. Very good, 1 times 10 to the 11th. You know the, uh, well, do you know the concentration of nickel? Let's see, do we know the concentration of nickel? 
yeah, 1 times 10 to the minus 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7. Very good. So I know the concentration of nickel, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7. And now if I have the signal from the sample, I can get the proportionality constant for the nickel. Right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what is the signal from the sample? Well, the sample with the nickel contained uh, was 4.9% um, larger. Okay, so what did we say was our uh, signal for the sample without the nickel? Just 100. Very good. So this, we can say, is what? 4.9% uh, more than 100. So that's, is that 104.9? That's right. It's 104.9. That's our signal there. Okay, very good. So uh, 104.9. I'll push pause here as I do it in the calculator. You do it too. All right, so hopefully you took a second and tried to solve this in your calculator, okay? But uh, I'm getting 4.45 times 10 to the seventh. Did you get that? Uh, I didn't do it actually. Well, you should have. You should always work on the calculator to make sure you're very comfortable with your calculator doing any type of problem that we're working on, okay? But 4.45 times 10 to the seventh is the Ki, sorry, K and Ni, can, the, um, proportionality constant for the nickel, our interferent. So then what do we do? Uh, don't we just take the ratio of the proportionality constant of the, the nickel to the proportionality constant of the silver? Very good. So we just solved this, 4.45 times 10 to the seventh over our, uh, which was our proportionality constant for the silver, 1 times 10 to the 11th, right? Yeah. Okay, there we go. So, this equals 4.45 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay, so what does that tell us? Uh, it's less than 1. Very good, it's less than 1. Now, this is really a, a number only for this method, but you can compare it to a different method and get the comparative, uh, again, selectivity coefficient for other methods to compare to. Okay, very good. Let's look at uh, one other thing here. We said that this, the signal here, we set it to 100. You see that? Yeah. We set that signal to 100. And so we were solving for the proportionality constant for our silver, right? Yeah. And so we know that the proportionality constant times the concentration is going to equal 100, right? Yeah. And that's what this equation down here had, is the proportionality constant times the, the silver equaling 100. You see that? Yeah, I see that. So essentially, we had 104.9, and we just subtracted the 100, and we wanted to look at just the 4.9. Oh, yeah. Right? So, I mean, we already knew that the sum of, or the product of these two was going to be 100. We set it at that, right? We said that that's what the signal was. So we could have just taken the 4.9 and said that it is equal to the uh, concentration of the nickel times the proportionality constant of the nickel, right? And that would have got us the proportionality constant of the nickel pretty fast. Yeah. However, we still needed to make sure we found out what the proportionality constant of the silver was later on to be able to, to use that ratio. Okay, very good. How about this one? 